Hi, I'm Rick Brimacombe, and on behalf of the Minneapolis Club and my firm, Brimacombe and Associates, welcome to Club Entrepreneur. We have a great crowd, and as I mentioned, everybody here is uh, um, looking forward to listening to serial entrepreneur Larry Abdo. Uh, like many of us, Larry has a serious case of the entrepreneurship bug. In fact, he has started 27 different ventures, including Big Fat Bacon and Nicollet Island Inn, and then also My Burger, and actually I stopped on the way over, and so a little treat for everybody, a little My Burger uh, card. Uh, I have a gift card, three of them actually. So who has not been to a My Burger that would like to go to a My Burger? Okay, well, uh, I have three cards. Um, I'll give a couple out, but then see Larry afterwards, and I'll let him deal with uh, the rest of you. Okay, hold on. I know we had a... Okay, so $25 gift card at My Burger buys two of you lunch, uh, fries, and a soda because I checked. So again, there are a lot of other hands, so see Larry afterwards. Um, but before we get to Larry's talk, um, Confessions of a Chronic Entrepreneur, I'd like to acknowledge and uh, thank our sponsors, Schweigman Lumberg Woosner, Olson Thielen CPAs, Irish Titan, a web development and e-commerce company. I know we have Darren right up here in front, and then Megan, where's Megan's over here on the la my left. Um, Irish Titan, as I mentioned, does web development and e-commerce. Uh, in fact, they were just named for the fifth straight year, right, Darren, five straight years. Um, one of the 100 best places to work, five years in a row, so that's fabulous. Congratulations to, to Darren and Irish Titan. Uh, Sunbelt Business Brokers is an M&A advisory firm. McLeod & Company, a holistic marketing agency, and they do uh, a lot of marketing for me, uh, for uh, my firm, for Club Entrepreneur, and for some of my portfolio companies, including uh, Sentara Drone Analytics Business. And I have two folks here, uh, Sam and Sam, over in the back. Sam, Guy Sam, and Gal Sam. Anyway, uh, thank you for your sponsorship and support. Highland Bank is a $500 million family-owned community bank. I have, uh, speaking of Sam and Sam, I have an Angie and Angie. Where is Angie and Angie? Oh, over there, sorry, okay. So they're uh, over there. Highland Bank, um, as I mentioned, a family-owned community bank. And then the Network Connect is a catalytic gateway for connecting investors, companies, uh, and service providers. Uh, Dick Summerstead and I uh, do that. It's kind of a cousin to Club Entrepreneur. Uh, in fact, we have an event next Tuesday uh, for the Network Connect, so anybody who's raising money or thinking about raising money might want to come to that. As far as these events, they shut down the online registration 24 hours in advance. I know I say it every time. You probably get sick of hearing it every time, but then guess what? I get emails every time from people saying, oh no, I want to go, and it got shut down. So if you register more than 24 hours in advance, it makes life easier for the club and for me, so please do that. Uh, the website clubby.com has a newsletter that you can sign up for uh, future events, uh, and there's a membership for $15 a month with uh, special offers for our club members. Uh, LinkedIn group, Club Entrepreneur Dash Minneapolis, there's about 2,600 people in the LinkedIn group, so that's a great way to connect with our audience. There's also a meetup group uh, that there's 1,800 people in, so those are two great ways to get connected. Uh, Minneapolis Club and, let's see, Margaret Leto is where? Oh, over here. Margaret used to work here at the club, and then, unfortunately, from the club's perspective, she moved on to a great opportunity, but I call Margaret out in the sense that she helped me get Club Entrepreneur up and running back in 2007 and was fully integral to making this a success. So thank you, Margaret. Get And then uh, anybody interested in the Minneapolis Club, there's a fishbowl outside the door there. It's been a great place for myself, uh, my family, both personally and professionally. So anybody who wants to learn about the Minneapolis Club you can drop your card in the fishbowl around the corner. Uh, last but not least, uh, Jungle Red is doing a, uh, an event called the Red Affair on Saturday 
which is the 14th, is coming Saturday. I see a yellow sport coat. I see a green sport coat. I don't see anybody wearing their red sport coats. That one kind of qualifies semi. Anyway, so Saturday, get out your red sport coats to go to a benefit for avenues of homeless youth. I've been for a couple years in a row. It's a great party. Suzanne, wave your hand over here. She put uh, cards out at your places, and you can see her afterwards. Uh, great music, good food, good wine. Uh, and again, that's uh, Saturday night if uh, anybody's interested in that. Uh, business of the month, we started um, in 2018, so we're a handful of months in. And I have a fishbowl here off to my right. Um, there's only a couple of cards in there. It's basically free social media marketing put on by McLeod for a month. And so anybody who's interested in that should drop a card in. And this month, this business of the month uh, is Bridgeview Legal Advisors. It's a woman-owned law firm focused on all aspects of wealth transfer, estate and trust administration and philanthropic planning. Anyway, you get pushed out through the Club E social channels as a business of the month. No cost to you. Folks at McLeod are kind enough to do that, and so you should drop your card in here, so that's business of the month. And then, as I mentioned, future events we have next Tuesday, um, the Network Connect uh, for folks, again, thinking about raising money or raising money. Club Entrepreneur St. Paul, Chum, where are you? Chum Struvi off to my right in the back. Uh, do you really, um, uh, what do you really sell is uh, next Wednesday's event at Club E St. Paul, and that's put on by a gentleman by the name of Carl Moe, who specializes in generating revenue. Carl has spoke here. I've read his book. He's a great speaker, so that's next Wednesday in St. Paul, if you can make that. Back here in Minneapolis, May 3rd, we're doing board readiness. So if you're thinking you want to be on a board, how do you do that? If you're on a board and you want to get better at adding value to that company, how might you do that? Uh, so we have a speaker uh, on May 3rd for board readiness, and then a couple of other events, but uh, I will cut those off to move forward to Larry Abdo. So Larry and I met probably about 20 years ago uh, through the business community and uh, here at the Minneapolis Club. Um, I consider him a friend as well as a trusted advisor. It's been a very nice uh, relationship that I've been able to have with Larry and Carol, his wife. Um, they've added a lot of value to me and the various things I've done. Um, I first got involved with him within the Fish Taco Fund in 2000, 2001, which was to help promote um, companies that were being spun out of Notre Dame. So either Notre Dame student-led or kind of Notre Dame DNA, if you will. And that was a precursor to the Irish Angel Funds, but I was involved uh, with that with Larry uh, back in the uh, early part of the last decade. And then Doug Ramler's here, where's Doug? I know Doug and Larry are both actively involved with the Irish Angels uh, now, and so that was a fun thing that he did with Larry. Uh, but then there's been many other, too many to mention right now. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to have him as a friend, as well as to have him speak to you all today. Uh, let's hear uh, about his 27 ventures, Larry Abdo. You know, the, the idea of being an entrepreneur has got so many different definitions by so many different places. And for me, it's really come down to when did you know you were an entrepreneur and when did you know that you got the disease? An uncurable, um, uh, unmanageable, uh, unexplainable, never-ending disease of being an entrepreneur. I can clearly say that the first day that I knew that I had to be an entrepreneur was kindergarten. I went to kindergarten, I didn't have a mat to take a nap in the afternoon. And I had to go sit on a chair and I realized, you know, rules are for other people, they're not for me. <laughs> so, and, and from that day on, I really never liked one day of school, even though I ended up with a five-year degree in accounting and corporate finance from the University of Minnesota. The, the real turning point for me as being an entrepreneur is when I read a book by James J. Ling who in the 60s was buying up a variety of different companies and putting them together based upon leveraging the, PV, the uh, price earnings ratio value. Pretty simple, they were just, he was just buying stuff. I said, my gosh, I mean, you can just like buy whatever you want. I mean, there's, there's no rule about what you have to buy or what you have to do. And when that was happening, I was in school and um, 
at, at, at business school at the University of Minnesota, and I found out that the government was sending to you directly, without any school interference, the money for you to pay for your college tuition on their student loan. So I took the money, invested in the stock market, graduated with no debt, a new yellow Cadillac, and a fiance. So that again sort of underscored the fact that while everybody else was worrying about getting a job, getting a career, uh, getting a ticket, that um, I, I absolutely just wasn't. And that's when I really knew that I was completely diseased about being an entrepreneur. And from that, um, I, I realized that I can do whatever I want to do, anytime that I want to do it, without asking permission from anybody, and doing it based upon my terms. So over the years, I've come to a conclusion about some really fun things. One, I'm not looking for a cure. I'm not looking for a pill. I'm not looking for some rehab center. I'm not looking for some group to go sit in. I'm not looking for a bunch of guys and girls to sit with and find out what's wrong with me. I'm not looking for that at all. I'm just looking for something that's going to make me happy and make me feel like I did my job being defined as using every God-given talent that I was given to do something with it. And I've continued to do that. I love absolutely every single day that I do my job. If it's really crummy, I love it. If it's really horrible, I love it. If it's impossible, I absolutely love it. And if it'll never, ever, ever get any better, that's the one that I want. I tell my kids, you know, being, you know, born in the, in the um, 40s and having parents that were in the service with uh, all of the stories of World War II and also being a cowboy fan, I said our tasks are, you can look at it in one or two ways. Either we got to get our boat back to Pearl or we, gotta, or we have to get our cattle to Belfouche. But there's nothing else but that path and that's what we have to do. No matter what you find along the way, the commitment is to get it there. And if you don't take enough time to enjoy it, then you're really not going to do the best job of getting it there. So that's why I say I just love everything that I do, good or bad, every single day. And I think that's how I measure my success. I mean, a bad day for me is a day in which, you know, I, I wasn't able to take advantage of something that I learned that day that could turn into something that I couldn't figure out how to make it something. All that means is this. As an entrepreneur, I'm in the soundbite business. I, for some reason, you know, my disease allows me to listen to really strange things and turn them into something. When, um, uh, when, I, when I graduated from college and I was playing the stock market, it wasn't more than like six months after I was married and that I decided to open up a stock brokerage firm, uh, go public, and do public offerings and, trading, and trade numbers. I was 24 years old. We did a public offering. We were the first publicly held NASD firm in the country, and I was the youngest broker dealer on the street. And I thought and that was not even any stress. It was just like, yeah, we can just do this, so let's do it. So we were trading 185 numbers, had 35 retail, and the market, the Dow, doubled. And this seemed to be a good time to get out. I mean, my gosh, it went from 500 to 1,000. What a great sell that was. Never should have sold it. From that, I took that money and was able to um, buy an ice company. But why did I buy the ice company? I'm at a picnic with some um, friends that were much younger than I were, and they had Coors beer in the trunk. Most of you remember that was hard to get. It had to come in, and you know, if you had Coors beer in your trunk, you, know, you had a party. I never came out of Colorado because it you know, didn't travel well because it, was, it wasn't pasteurized. And they were scrapping to get ice to keep the beer cold. And the discussion was centered around where are we going to go to get the ice, where are we going to go to get the ice? And I said, my gosh, something is happening here where ice now becomes a, a hard to get commodity. And the soundbite was, where are we going to get the ice? And that put me in the ice business with an old, rundown, antiquated plant in St. Paul that I turned into the highest volume north of Chicago um, that, was, that was doing packaged ice and was selling packaged ice to all the grocery stores. You know, that, and that every day was fun. I mean, I'd be standing on a ladder, beating on a bin, trying to get the ice out, driving trucks, uh, being there in the middle of the night when the power went out, and I never thought that was a problem. I always thought that was just a great thing to do. When, 
When we disposed of the ice company, and it was really a great thing because the competitor wanted to buy it, when the competitor shows up and gives you a check this long, you got to make a decision. I took the money. Another business I never should have sold. After the ice business, I went into some kind of a phase of, of um, you know, looking, looking on how this ice experience is going gonna, is gonna to roll into something else. And one of the customers that we had at the, with the ice business was the state fair. So I saw all these food booths that were at the state fair and put together a product that I never made, didn't know how I was going to serve it, didn't know what it was going to cost. The only thing that I had was a product and a name for it. And went to the fair and got permission to make and sell this product on the grounds. And we had six weeks to build a facility, come up with a menu, source the products, and get it over the counter at the state fair. That was 43 years ago. That turned into, what it, you know, which is now Big Fat Bacon, and you know, without telling any you know, closely held secrets, selling 35 tons of bacon in a 12-day period is a lot of bacon. <laughs> the, um, the other thing that, that sort of helped me um, um, fuel this disease that I have and not look for any kind of a cure is that I don't do any research. I mean, my research is really, really simple. Um, uh, my burger, which is now 15 years old, more than that maybe, John? 15 years old, um, we have uh, um, six operating units and, and on our way to 20 in the Twin Cities. I had a building downtown that I own. And I don't know, I, maybe I'll get to the real estate business, but the real estate business is just like a block and you got something and so they pay you and that's it. Um, no fun. But with the, with the burger business, I had a lease all signed for somebody to put a burger joint into our building, and he wouldn't sign the lease, and I'm going to Notre Dame to teach a class, and I have a failed lease in my, in my portfolio, and I'm on the plane. I said, you know what? I think I'm just going to open up my own burger place. So I get to class. I scratch out on a, a notebook the name, the, what the operating uh, revenue would look like, uh, what the logo would look like, um, you know, how, many, how much uh, uh, it would cost to get the store done. And I went to this MBA class, and I took a $100 bill, and I stuck it up on the blackboard, gave him my spiel, and I went around the room, and I said, what do you think? Saturated market, cost too much for fixed asset, hard to get people to work, uh, margins are too low, can't grow it fast enough. Finally, I got to one lady, and she said, that's like a really good idea. It reminds me of In-N-Out. So I took the 100 bucks. Walked over and gave it to her, and I said, thank you for the research. And that was it. <laughs> I would say that's the most research I've done on anything that I've done, and, and, and paid for it. That was like $100. <laughs> um, some of the other stuff in which absolutely no research was done um, was the, the grain milling business. I mean, how I ever got into that business, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what motivated me to do that, but it just seemed so wonderful that we had these old plants, you know, Pillsbury or somebody else owned it. It was still doing stuff. There were still people there. They were still making a product. They weren't doing very well. It didn't cost very much money to get it. So it sounded to me like that'd be kind of a fun thing to do. So I bought this plant, started bagging up stuff that they were selling to horses. That was great. Didn't ride anymore, but that was great. Um, we ha I I've done construction. Uh, 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 trucking. Um, I got to look at my wife to remind me what else I did. I keep forgetting. Um, and uh, and hospitality. You know, with with hospitality, I I bought the Nicollet Island Inn in 2005, sitting at a table having lunch with the owner, who said, you know, you should buy this. And I said, why? He said, well, you've been here all the time. You always support the place. You should probably own it. I said, okay, that makes really good sense. How much do you want for it? He gave me a number. I said, that sounds really good. Okay, we got a deal and we shook hands. I never took any inventory. I never knew how much wine was there. I never knew what their sales were. I never knew what their past obligations were. Hell, I didn't even know what the rent was. But it sounded like a really good thing to do. And it's really, really, really been fun. But again, no research. If I would have gone out and got a uh, hired somebody to tell me what the density is of hotels and what the ADR is and what the turnover is and what the cost of this is and that is. I mean, I would have too much information. I don't think I could process it. But when you see smiling faces and you see people laughing when they're at the table and you see them taking out their wallet and spending it on something, that's about all I need to know. 
All you have to do is make that part better, and you'll be just fine. The, the idea of, of having um, a legacy or a strategy escapes me. I was at a panel a couple of years ago about real estate because I developed 150 buildings or residential stuff, residential meaning apartment buildings, um, in nine different states. And um, so I ended up with a fairly, fairly good sized portfolio, which we still have and we manage today. But I can tell you, it's not as much fun as the fair, it's not as much fun as the burgers, it's not as much fun as Dalton and Wade, it's not as much fun as all the retail stuff that we're doing, because you know, there's not a lot of creativity there. Uh, where there is, and you can't solve the problem as quickly. You know, when somebody has a bad meal, you just buy them another meal, and it's over with. You know, somebody's got a leak in their roof, you know, you gotta find a, got a kind of a leak guy, you gotta get it fixed, you gotta, you know, re, re, reimburse them for the stuff that they lost, it goes on and on, you can't solve it that fast. But I'm at this panel, and they were talking about the, the uh, long-term strategy for real estate holdings, and how they're gonna pass it on through a legacy transition and to their family. And I wish I could remember the name of the guys. I mean, they're way above me, both in uh, probably education, money, and pedigree. So, of course, I don't want to remember them, because why? Uh, we're just, we're just another piece of information that won't be helpful. And when they got to me and they asked me what my strategy was for long-term uh, real estate, I told them, well, I believe that I'm going to die before my wife. She's pretty smart. My kids are, and they'll figure it out. And that's it. They said, well, what are you going to do about trusts or wills or stuff like that? And I said, well, no, they'll, they'll figure it out. I said, I'm not going to worry about any of that stuff. It doesn't seem to me that that's much of a problem. I've got it. She has half of it. The kids will get the rest of it. And what else do you need? So there was a, it was a funny exchange of questions after that because they really thought I was kidding. But what that underscores is sort of this whole, you know, um, uh, disease that I, that, I, that I deal with every day, but happily deal with it every day. I mean, why would I want to worry about that? I mean, it's just going to work itself out. Everybody's done it forever. You know, the guy dies ahead of the girl. The girl has the money. They go to Cuba or to South America. They come back with Fernando, and, you know, it all goes on. I mean, <laughs> you know. I tell Carol, start looking now, you know, and just go on one of those things to click, 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 see who's available in the next five years. You know, it'll work out fine. So I'm not doing any planning on, on, uh, on legacy. My children, on the other hand, are doing the planning. And I know usually the dad comes in, he's got a piece of paper, and they bring up the corner, and then they have the kid sign. They have no idea what it's in. And in our place, it's the reverse. They come into me with a piece of paper, they lift it up, and I have to sign it. So, but the whole point's still the same. I mean, you know, it's there, it's just stuff. It's, it's a free fall life, it's a happy life. Um, it's doing only what I want to do when I want to do it and only picking on things that, that uh, make me happy and have a real opportunity for success. But, you know, even break even sometimes is success. And just thinking about what you learned from that or, or how you felt about that or what mystery it solved for you. You know, to me, that's, that's the kind of knowledge that uh, street knowledge, you know, back alley knowledge that you never forget and you carry with you all the time. It also sharpens this whole idea of your gut being good and listening to sound bites. All of that is, you know, is significant. You know, I'm, I'm looking at something now. I'm sitting having dinner with somebody. Um, they're talking about their business. Um, they're talking about the issues that they're having in their business. And in that conversation, there's this little clip, like five words, that I hear. That's the only thing all of a sudden I hear. And what that really is is dead inventory that's sitting on the shelf that's worth a million dollars that they can't move. And all I know is that I've got a free delivery of a million dollars worth of goods that I essentially don't have to pay for until I sell it. And what's the, what's the risk of taking something for free and selling it? But the soundbite was, I have a million dollars worth of dead inventory. There's no research here. There's no nothing here. You know, just back up the truck, give me the stuff, and then if the cash register rings, you'll get some money. But to me, you know, that's, it's not within anything else that we've ever done. It's something that's completely different, but to me, it's exciting. 
I mean, I've never bought a million dollars worth of inventory that I've never seen. I bought an inn for you know, over a million dollars that I didn't know much about. But it's just another opportunity to be a serial entrepreneur, a diseased entrepreneur, um, and, and I'd say a happy entrepreneur by just looking at the things that really do make you happy. Having, you know, the, the friends that I have that, have been, that you know, want to know how to get started. I mean, there's no clue on when to get started. Um, they want to know how you, how you can stay married and do what you do. There's, there's no clue for that. I mean, there's, there's no cure for any of this stuff. But, we've, but where we've come to is that my wife and I lately have been teaching in two different spheres, and it's not, it's, and we don't like to call it give back. That seems to be a, a, a trendy term to use, that if you do well, you should be able to give back, give back your to a time, treasure, and talent. Um, what we like to do is be additive with the experiences that we have. At the University of Minnesota, we do what's called the Abdo Dinner Series. We do it two or three times a year. It's with couples that are in the MBA program. We buy them dinner at the inn, um, and we pour a lot of wine. Helps, a lot of wine, um, a lot of wine. And we talk about what it's like to be married to an entrepreneur. And we get really personal, and we drive a very personal conversation. And what's come out of that are some really gratifying things that, in a sense, legitimize the lifestyle that I've been living. The one that I'm the most proud of and the school hates the most is when we get a letter written to us in the school that says this was the best four hours that they ever spent at Carlson. <laughs> That's tough. The next one is when one and the couple say that we listened, we never talked about this before, we talked about it on the way home, and we decided to break up because I can't do what he wants to do, and he really never told me what it is that he wanted to do. We think that that's very gratifying. Another one is where they're driving home, and uh, they talk this thing through, and we see him two years later. And they come up to us, grab my wife, give her a kiss, back up, and shows a picture of a little girl, and says, that if you didn't give us permission, we never would have had a child. You showed us how to have a business and to have an entrepreneurial life and to have a family. And for us, you know, those are worth all of the wine that we pour down their gullets to get them to talk. The other thing that we do that brings this whole free fall, undisciplined, unstructured, non-legacy personality together is we do a thing called seniors teaching seniors, where we're seniors. And we go to high school where the high school seniors are there. And we can't buy them wine, so we bring them burgers. Same effect. And the first thing that we ask is, why do you think we're so stupid? And they unload. <laughs> Honest to God, they unload. Technology, uh, bigotry, um, social justice, um, on and on and on. And the discussion is very, very lively, but my belief is that for us as seniors to be relevant, that we have to spend time with the other seniors, and I, and I like to view that as being able to kick my relevance curve out 10 years. You know, you're relevant up here, and then all of a sudden you start to fall off, and nobody wants to talk to you, and they don't call you for golf, and you, know, you forget how to play bridge. But I want to kick that out by spending time talking to these seniors in high school and try to get that nugget, that soundbite of information that they're talking about. The most interesting soundbite that we heard when we finally, in the last 10 minutes, asked them what they want to learn from us was they want to learn how to write a letter to someone that they would like or a note to someone that they would like to take on a date. They would like to know how to eat at a restaurant and not out of a paper bag. And they would like to know what kind of a conversation can you have and look a date in the eye like you talk to your grandparents. There's no technology. There's no money involved. There's no where's the opportunity. There's none of that stuff. I mean, they're, 
they're talking about understanding the human way of getting through life in a world that they're living in that has filled with technology and their lives are driven, are driven by technology. So for us to hear that, both at the master's level and at the high school level, in my mind, it legitimizes the fact that the experiences that I've had and all the different things that I've done all come into, if you're going to be a happy person, somebody's got to talk to you about what it is to be happy and what it's to, not, not to be happy. And how do you manage the fact that you want to be happy? And how do you want to be an entrepreneur and a happy entrepreneur? And how do you want to make sure you measure it correctly? I mean, my wife and I, you know, one day, who knows what date it was? She probably does. They remember all these dates. But she said, why can't we? Why don't we? You know, what, you know should we? And I said, give me a number, and I'll go get you that number. I'm very capable of getting any number you want. Call it 100 million, call it a billion. I'll go get the number. But... I won't be home, you won't see me, don't ask me where I am, don't ask me what I'm doing, and don't ask me when I'm coming back. But I'll deliver the billion dollars. She said, no, I think we can be fine without the billion dollars. So the choice was go for a relationship and go for a, a business practice that keeps you and your, and your, your mind and your heart and your, and your family together so that no matter what the hell happens, um, you're looking at the right things at the right time to make sure that you can define yourself as being a successful person. And, that, and that's the way I live my life. Maybe finally, and I don't even know what time it is or how long I'm supposed to talk. Does anybody know? Uh, well, i got a few minutes. Quarter to one. All right. Say that again? A half hour? God. I have to turn the page for that one. I'm not Irish, you know. I don't do that as well as you do. Um, the, uh, the idea of, of trying, to keep, trying to keep this in a happy balance also translates to me is running two balance sheets at the same time. We all know what to do with your business balance sheet. We know how strong it is. We know where the holes are. You know, what you, you know if you can buy something, if you can weather the storm. You know what it's worth if you sell it. You know, if you want to take and develop a new product line, if you want to spend money on R&D, you've got it all in your balance sheet. You know what your bankability is. You also know if you can buy out shareholders. You know all sorts of stuff that's in your balance sheet, and you look at it every day, every month, every year with all sorts of people. That's the first balance sheet an entrepreneur always looks at. But in parallel with that, you have to look at your relationship balance sheet. What do you do every single day because you're an entrepreneur, because you don't, you don't have to report to anybody, because your life is your own, because you can decide exactly what you want to do, you can choose to have a balance sheet for your relationship that you keep track of every single day. And what do you do in order to make the equity in that relationship as strong as the equity in the balance sheet in the business that you're, run, that you're running and, or trying to create? And that's a challenge for a lot of people. You know, in, what does it take to make sure that you talk about those markers that you, that you register those markers, and that you know that you have those markers. When your business goes bad and you've got plenty of money in your bank account, you know you can survive. When your relationship goes bad and you've got no equity in your relationship, that is not going to survive. And if you lose your business, uh, you could keep your relationship, but if you lose your relationship, you could lose your business. So keeping those two in parallel also gives you the opportunity to have this, what I call, an enormously happy life because you're running your life and you're running your business with, with the full idea of making both of them great, making both of them the best part of you and making both of them the, the, um, uh, the, the, the fruit of everything that you were given that you can do. I'm not a ball player. I mean, I, there's no way I could throw a ball from the mound to the, to the plate. I mean, I, it can't happen. I don't have any desire to be a ball player. I don't have the acumen. I don't have the skill. I don't have any of that stuff to be a ball player. I've got no desire to be a ball player. Therefore, I will never pick up a ball and become a ball player. But I always marvel at the ball player when you hear the crack of the bat, and he takes four steps to the right and two steps back, and it's in his glove. Hell, I can't even see the ball flying, much less being able to catch it. Well, that intuition that he has is the same intuition that an entrepreneur has to have. That same intuition is the thing that you have to apply every single day 
to all of these different things. I mean, it doesn't make any difference what it is. It's not like, you know, I'm in the railroad business, so we're just going to go down the track of, you know, building this railroad. Not for me. I mean, hell, first stop we make, if there was a bar there, I'd probably want to buy the bar. And if there was cattle on the other side, we probably should have a ranch. I mean, why not? I mean, it doesn't hurt you to do that. It, it helps you to do that, and it also gives you this freedom to be able to exercise all of the things that people have been saying to you and talking to you all your life. I mean, think about this. Today, most people are going to know their great-grandparents, and they're going to know their great-grandchildren. That's like seven generations. You know how much knowledge and power is in seven generations? A, 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 a serial entrepreneur, a diseased entrepreneur, will take everything he can from his great-grandparents and everything he can from his great-grandchildren as, as, as long as they are there to understand what the changes are through the sound bites that are happening in all those conversations. I think that that's a fabulous thing. But you have to start out with the idea that I'm an entrepreneur, I'm diseased, I'm not following, uh, I'm not going to kindergarten again, um, I'm not following anybody's path, and these are the things that are important to me. And that drives, in my mind, just this greatest calmness in your life every single day, and then there's never a problem, because this is what you want to do. This is the life that we chose. I don't know how many more minutes have I got. Any, can I answer any questions? Yes. Absolutely nothing. Not one change on any day that I live. <laughs> Nothing. Yes? Biggest business failure was, was um, having a business out of town in a hard to reach place um, where we couldn't, uh, couldn't keep control of it. Yeah, I, it, was, it, it, was, it was a good business. We loved the business, but I mean, you had to be there every day and I wasn't going there. And it cost. We just paid it. And you know, that's a great story because when it all, when we were in the architectural um, cabinet business, in order to get out of that, I had to win the two largest contracts that were ever issued in that town. I won them, had no capacity to do them, went to every shop that made cabinets, parsed out all of the work, so therefore I wasn't going to have any competition. And so everybody was working for me, I was working for the customer, delivered everything, got all the money took all the equipment, put it in three trailers, and sent it to another town. Three years later, I got a call, and they said, what do you want to do with this equipment? I said, burn it. I don't care. We're done. I wouldn't, I wouldn't sell it. I wouldn't let anybody come in and pick my bones. I wouldn't sell the business. Just shut it down and move on. I wasn't going to cry over it or anything else. But every once in a while, my, my partner reminds me of that. <laughs> yes? Yes. I advocate to them, don't listen to anybody until you know what it is that you want and you can defend it. Don't listen to somebody who's trying to give you information because generally they are jealous, they don't want you to succeed, um, they feel left out, and if you do, so, do something, you're going to break up this old gang of mine. I said, don't listen to them. You, you come up with an idea and you tell somebody and they say, oh, I don't think that'll work out. Well, you don't ever want to hear that. Why would you listen to that person at all? So I tell them, don't listen. They, they ask me, well, how do you manage the way you present this, your, your balance sheet for your business, the balance sheet for your relationship, and then your friends? I said, don't plan on having any friends. It makes it simple. You know, they're not going to understand anyway. So don't worry about it. So I do advocate that, that they get committed to why they want to do it before they try to figure out how they're going to do it. Yes. Yes, I did. Yeah. No, I, I read it. Um, I'm, it was, uh, I don't remember what it said, but I read it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. What's the most embarrassing thing to close to the MBAs you're willing to tell us today? The most well, besides that I hated school? Um, well, that's not embarrassing. That's not embarrassing? <laughs> uh, God. I, I, you know, I don't know if I can answer that without, without thinking about it. I mean... I don't think I've been embarrassed about much. I didn't streak across the campus. Um, I had a Cadillac that I bought when we were in college, and I parked it at the door of the business school where it said no parking, tow-away zone. 
And I was dating Carol at the time, and she said, how can you park this car here? It says, they're going to tow it away. I said, nobody has a car this good, and they don't dare tow it. Parked there for two years. <laughs> yes. Um, she chose wisely. <laughs> now, I, I, I say that with laughter, but when we graduated from the University of Minnesota, there were 275 students. She was the only female. So she had plenty of choices. I had to work like hell. <laughs> she came from a family where her dad was uh, a successful entrepreneur who had a real love and lust for business, and uh, she grew up with that, so it was an easy step for her. My mother called her a walk-in. Yes. Um, yes, they are. Um, um, they, you know, we're we're trying to create this family business. Um, you know, they all have different skills. Since they were young, you know, I've always taught them that we should always use the best person for the best job. All of my boys can drive uh, big trucks, tractor trailers. Um, but when you need to have that job done, I said, the best one is Corey. So why don't you just let him do it, even though he may be just 10% better. Always pick the best one to do it. So in our businesses, we're working through that now. Yes, making sure the best person does the best job and that we, you know, you know, we don't ignore new opportunities as long as we've got the existing ones under control. And we opened up Dalton and Wade, a restaurant and bar, 270 bourbons on the shelf that you should go to. And... Um, Yes, I mean, somebody liked it that was here. And um, I mean, it was, and it's, a, it's a use of all of our talents. So they are, they are following in, those, in that footstep, yes. Whether I like it or not, I have no choice. They're just there doing it. Uh, I started 27, and of the 27, three failed. Not bad. I've invested in probably 30, and... None have succeeded. So I, I like my numbers better. <laughs> Did I miss somebody? My daughter? I didn't miss you, did I? No. Are you asking a question, ma'am? Oh, yes, that's my daughter right there. <laughs> yes. Yes. The numbers? <laughs> well, you know, these are the surprises. The surprises were that the bridge went down. You know, that was a surprise. Uh, the crash of, um, of 08, that was bad. Um, the, um, uh, they, they, they redid the, some road someplace where they shut that down. But, you know, those are the surprises. I mean, the everyday surprises... I mean, this restaurant and inn have been operating for 36 years. So, you know, there was plenty of stuff there to work with. Um, I wouldn't, I, I don't think I was surprised. I mean, but I have to say that honestly, because what, what was, what, oh my gosh, there was no inventory. Okay, call somebody and buy the inventory. I mean, the solutions are pretty simple. We had more problems staffing than we had customers. Yes. You. I, I like to say I have no partners, except um, in, in limited venues. I have the person that looks like me sitting next to you, who's my brother Bob, um, who sometimes acts as my dad or my uncle or my partner. <laughs> but yes, and, and, I, and we do very well. We own real estate together, and we've done some other stuff together, and, and we do well as partners. He's the lawyer, and I'm the client. So that's how that works out. No. Yes, except with my children now, that's changing. Yes, but it makes it easy too, because you go in the inn or any of the other properties. You know, they know. You know, it's just, just me. No committee. No nothing. It's just me. So, and they get used to my screwball personality, and then we we do fine. But and I like it that way. Yes.
You know, I like them both. Honestly, God, it's whatever you can. I like them both. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if you're supposed to say this or not, but I wanted to buy Dunn Brothers coffee so bad. I mean, I chased that for two years. I mean, we got right down to the wire, and I didn't end up with it. And I thought that's an underutilized brand that really needed a lot of work, that had so much potential, that was at the right price, and I just wanted it. I wanted it. I wanted it. And I didn't get it. But I'm not going to start my own coffee shop. Yes, sir? Uh, yeah, John's pretty good. I think Corey's better. Mandy used to play on a softball team. And uh, my son-in-law, I don't know, he could be a sleeper. I don't know. But um, yeah. they can throw a baseball. They play in several leagues. I would say you summed it up really good, yeah. And, and, don't, and don't pick on things that you're not good at or you're not happy doing it just because somebody told you you should or, or your education tells you you can, you know. My gosh, you know. There's a, can I have one more minute? There was a, there was a, a, um, a note that was sent to me from um, uh, the chairman of, uh, of um, Mercedes-Benz and these are nine points that have got him concerned. That uh, software is going to disrupt everything. Uber doesn't own anything. Airbnb doesn't own anything. Cars are going to be self-driving. Everyone will order a car on their cell phone. Hotels will be non-existent because of Airbnb. They won't need lawyers anymore because IBM Watson is more accurate than lawyers, 90 versus 70%. Doctors are going to have this tricorder Star Trek thing, going to come out this year. They're with 54 biometrics. They're going to be better than the doctors. Insurance companies are going to go out of business because nobody's going to have cars. Real estate's going to go to hell because there's nobody that needs to go there because they're going to all work from home in better neighborhoods. Longevity is going to move from 80 to 100 by the year 2036. And 75% of people will be out of jobs. And nobody needs to go to school because everything's going to be on your devices. And I'm looking at this and saying, wow, this is supposed to be a pretty smart guy. And I said, you know what? I'm not listening to any of that crap. I'm done with it. I'm just going to work my day the way I work my day and then die before my wife and then I'll be fine. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Larry. We have the room as long as anybody would uh, like to stay, so please stay, talk to one another, go talk to Larry, and visit a MyBurger. See ya. <laughs>